Hello, and welcome to the fifth episode of season two of the ESG Experience Podcast, brought to you by Conservice ESG. I'm Ryan Nelson, CEO of Conservice ESG. Whether you're an ESG expert or just dipping your toes in the ESG universe to understand how it could help with engaging stakeholders, mitigating risks, and attracting investors, this podcast is for you. Together, we will navigate the alphabet soup of ESG, discuss ideas, review strategies, and share industry news and trends. You may have already noticed that my typical co-host, Healy Lev, is not here today. Um, she'll be back soon, don't worry. I do have a little bit of uh, kind of imposter syndrome. Uh, for those who watch the CBS Sunday Morning Show, which I really enjoy, Whenever uh, Jane Pauley is not there, I'm like, oh, man, I'm very disappointed that I don't get to hear from Jane Pauley and some other imposter is hosting the show. So I hope not too many people feel that way and are, are disappointed. I know Healy has a lot of fans. I hope they're not too disappointed, um, but I'm going to get us through this. All right. So today, companies' social efforts often center around employees' health and well-being. Well, this, of course, is very important, should not be lost or minimized. Um, companies should also focus and include uh, on their surrounding communities. So not just think about um, your own organization and, and the health and well-being of everyone there, but the impact you might have on a community. Um, so in this episode, we'll be discussing the anthropological impact of ESG. We are very pleased to be joined by our own ESG expert, Hannah Nelson. Hello, Hannah. Hello. All right. Hannah Nelson achieved degrees in environmental studies and also anthropology at Loyola University of Chicago. She's a lead accredited professional in interior design and construction, as well as a FitWell ambassador. At Conservice ESG, she guides project teams through their lead version 4.1 recertification processes. In her free time, she enjoys nature photography and hiking with her husband and dog. Welcome, Hannah. Very nice to have you. It's great to be here. Thank you. Good. Um, when I was kind of looking at this, I was wondering, do you enjoy nature, photography, and hiking, or do you enjoy nature photography and hiking? And I think it's the latter, right? Ryan, uh, I'm a very big fan of the Oxford comma. You would know the difference. Uh, it's nature <laughs> photography. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nature photography. Got it. Uh, and right. And if we didn't use Oxford comma, this would be harder to discern. Exactly. Um, but we'll, we, we'll leave that for a whole uh, a whole other podcast. OK, we got a couple things, Hannah, that you and I have to address regularly as colleagues that that we should spend a minute on. I think I think it's worth it. Um, mm -hmm. And then we'll get into the, into the topic. So we got to talk about dogs. Obviously, we enjoy the, the pet chatter that we have um, here. Mm -hmm. Um, tell what kind of dog or dogs do you have, names, uh, anything you want to tell me? Oh, yeah. Um, my dog who came with the uh, husband package uh, <laughs> is a, a Brittany Spaniel. She's five years old. Her name is Pixel, and she regularly floods the feed of my Instagram and uh, the our work chat. She does. Um, <laughs> that, that's wonderful. Uh, I also have two dogs, um, both lab mixes, rescue lab mixes. So I don't know exactly the whole package, um, but that's pretty much, you know, my, my life, uh, my wife and I spending time with, with our two dogs uh, when we're not, we're not working tater tot and coconut. I gotta um, say so yes. uh, you putting Dr. Tater tot on the, in the about us team section of the website, when I was first applying here, definitely sold it. I that's had to right. join for Dr. Tater tot. Tater Tot has closed a deal or two and has Absolutely. also helped uh, recruit great candidates such as yourself. So that's good to know. The other thing we have to cover, uh, I really enjoy uh, every time you introduce yourself that you say no relation. You, we both share <laughs> the last name Nelson. Um, and coincidentally, as far as we know, there's no relation. Do mm -hmm. you know much? I don't actually know much about kind of like past um pretty close family. Like my dad doesn't know his dad. So I don't know much beyond that. Do you know much about the Nelson name or where it came from or your, or your history? Yeah, I definitely uh, married into the Nelson name. I, my maiden's name's a lot longer. Uh, the 
But when I went to Iceland, I learned that they're the only country who still uses that uh, surname suffix of son or daughter. Uh, so uh, that, but if if it was, if we still used it now, my last name would be George Son, right? So Nelson, George. it's that's old, that's old Nordic, essentially. Old Nordic, okay. Yeah, that's that seems right. For I always kind of thought, we're more Irish or whatever, but I, I sure. think it's really, it feels like more Nordic uh, in me. So maybe, maybe that's make, makes sense, but okay. Well, yes, I'm glad to have another Nelson uh, in the, in the department. Um, let's talk about anthropology now. And um, for me, I guess, I guess for any of those that don't necessarily know exactly what anthropology is, maybe we could just touch on that for a minute. I understand it to be some, study of human interactions or something to that effect. Maybe you could, could tell us a little more on that. Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, the internet dictionary is going to help me out on this one because there's some pretty broad definitions, but when you get down to it, um, it's essentially the science that deals with the origins, physical and cultural development, as well as biological characteristics and the social customs and beliefs of humans. So when I boil it down for folks who just really don't know what it is, it's how humans interact in a society and culturally and the development of that. Right. That's extremely interesting. I mean, over the, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years of humans, I imagine that the interaction has been very, very different. Uh, and it seems like there is a lot to study there. That's very cool. So with that is... in mind, even. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, but it is, it can be very similar. So that's, that's also mm. interesting to study because while cultures can be very different in and of themselves, when you boil it down, we're all pretty similar. Mm, so the commonalities, yeah, it feels like maybe it's quite different, but then you're like, at the end of the day, these commonalities are something like always exist. And this exactly. is kind of what's happening. Uh, that yep. is, even if we go back, like, centuries and centuries you still find those kind of things right we're all just we're all just humans and we just want food shelter love security so we're getting to psychology a little maslow's hierarchy of needs in there but um when you boil it down we're all humans so as as we diverge culturally we're we still have that commonality of our humanness so when you talk about the interaction of humans you also have to incorporate biology psychology into it as well wow no it's very interesting um we yeah no i, I really appreciate that and, and what is it that um got you interested uh in, in joining the podcast or having a discussion today or very specifically when did you how did you want to bring this to the realm of esg yeah well i appreciate that you all encourage us to come on to the podcast and um there's and you actually care about what we have to say as a company and as individuals, which is really nice. I, I mean, I'm not just hyping you up. This is really nice. Um, <laughs> and I thought it would be nice, especially when I heard um, Susan Hunt Stevens kind of mm -hmm. in her episode kind of call us as call us um, privileged individuals, maybe more company owners out just flat out straight us called called y'all out saying <laughs> it's your our responsibility i just stopped i was walking listening oh, i stopped wow. and say oh dang she did that because i was thinking it but she said it so and then you didn't edit it out so maybe i have maybe i have something to say that you actually maybe would want to hear that talks about um us i mean maybe quote unquote not little people, but the other folks surrounding you that that make what you created keep functioning. Yeah, no, um, I appreciate that. And yeah, when she said it, I, um, I don't know. Maybe I wasn't quite as shocked or, or or taken aback because I have processed that and thought about it, and and yeah. and you know, um, someone's not saying that to you all the time, but yeah, do do share share that sense of um what she was talking about sense of responsibility and recognition of 
uh, privilege and sense of, um, you know, whatever. It is. I, I, I've thought about those things, so it wasn't uh, too surprising. And yeah, like the idea of editing out never crossed anybody's <laughs> mind. Um, but yeah, no, um, of course it takes it takes a village is an interesting uh, comment that I, that I appreciate. But I think kind of, you know, to the topic we mentioned or to your point, now you're talking about in an organization like ours as a hundred person ESG department and as a 4,000 person company, there are a lot of people that are very important to, to making things work and for us being able to do what we want to do for our customers and for our mission and for our, our vision. It's not just the 150 people in management or the, the 15 people on executive leadership. It, it, it takes everyone and we want to spend a lot of time focusing on the health and well-being uh, of those people for various reasons. But then also, you know, like you said, the, the surrounding uh, community and how big do you think a company should think about the community? Is that just like the ones where their offices are or how do we think of, <laughs> of, of an impact? Yeah, I think um, we tend, or companies tend to just focus on the employees and um, which is great. We appreciate it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, but there's also, you companies can also, I think, get stuck in a self-congratulatory cycle in so far as they're like, look at all we're doing. We give them X amount of PTO, which is great. Again, we appreciate it, but we're the privileged ones who were able to stand out amongst the crowds who were applying for this job. And we had the privilege to get the education mm. that would make us qualified for this job. And while we recognize the privilege and can benefit from that monetarily, socially, et cetera, there's also other folks who are um, stakeholders, not just shareholders, stakeholders in the company and its functions. So that would be the surrounding community. So you can think locally. We can talk about even just maybe adopting a highway and cleaning that. That's that's benefiting the community, but that's small scale. And what made me want to come on here is we can talk about how we could challenge uh, companies to act locally think locally, but then also expand so that they're not complacent, right? So there's also, so the folks that surround the community shouldn't be forgotten, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think, you know, you talked about um, owners or executives who maybe have some particular sense of ownership, uh, privilege, a certain level of compensation and things like that that then are thinking of the employees that make that cog function. And then you're, you're quickly accepting that same responsibility and saying, we are the employees, but also other people wanted this job and I was lucky enough to get it. You were lucky enough to get it. So you're recognizing that um, almost the sense of fortune is contextual and there's always, or likely there's someone else who um, you know, you, you should be thinking of, thinking of. So there's, that's very interesting that somebody wanted the job, you got it, you appreciate and or deserve and or want, you know, PTO and compensation and all, all those appropriate things that, that we need. But you're also like, oh, we left some other people behind in a sense, or are there are other people functioning. How are we impacting them or how could we? And maybe if you go to the list of like, well, donate a few bucks here, do this adopt the highway and put your company sign on it. Uh, okay, maybe that's, you know, the least, least yeah. you could. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, to call back to Susan Hunt Stevens in the February 18th, 2022 episode, definitely listen to it. She was great. Um, plug, plug, plug. Um, they, she said that going into COVID, and I think backing up, the, the folks who work in ESG, I think, are hyper aware of this privilege and their impact on both the environment and the social aspect of it. Um, so I think this is, we're in the a great spot to be the ones to spearhead this initiative um, as a, as an area of 
the economy, I guess. Um, so Susan Hunt Stevens said going into COVID, they saw, quote, if employees believe that their company is making a positive difference in this world, only 7% are actively looking for a new role. If people do not believe that their company is making a strong, positive impact in this world, nearly 50% are looking and open to a new role. And totally, that's totally right. So if we want to keep the folks who care, and if we want to, and if we want to attract more folks who are socially, environmentally minded and governance, but I can't fit that into my sentence. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, that's, we can't be stagnant, right? So we're going to, we need to think, how can we help this surrounding community that is ultimately, ultimately impacted by our presence? How about the families of the employees? How about the families that, um, of the folks who directly Im are impacted by our services? So it's more of a call to action is sort of, is the long and short of why I'm here, I guess. Yeah. Well, I, we're we're poo pooing the adopt the highway plan, so hopefully <laughs> they, they don't see a dip in, uh, in too much of a dip in the adopt the highway plan. Sorry, uh, but no, I get it. Yeah, sorry, but sorry, we're ruining your future. Um, no, we're agreeing that that's that's table stakes, um, if you will. But there's mm. there's more to be done. Um, than that uh i, I had thought I, I, and i just kind of lost but um but no um yes i very much appreciate that and we do have the responsibility oh i know what i was going to say is that what's what i like in the circles that we run with if you will that we're having the conversation like kind of the next level conversations about what to do we're not having the conversations of should we be doing this or you know do we actually have privilege or that's you know th these kind of things i remember for so long constantly just debating if climate change should even be considered is it real is this, is this a, and it was really rewarding to kind of be like you know what i haven't had that argument in a long time the I people that i talk to day. now yeah we're actually just those are assumptions that are already there and we're actually just talking about solutions and this and that. You don't have to like think that if you say something, it's a trigger word, and somebody's be like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, that's not real." You know, we're like we're actually yeah. just—it's kind of in the past, at least in the circles that I'm typically uh, engaging on, which is fine because right. we're like solving problems instead of debating if there is a problem or not. Yeah, and ESG in and of itself is growing, and so our conversations are the louder ones if if that makes sense sort of we're not drowned out by climate deniers from what i see there's caveats to everything but it's our conversations are louder of climate global climate change is real we're not bringing a snowball to congress and saying well if con if climate change is real then how is this snowball here well yeah yeah we we were but uh, yeah. it was some like no time longer. ago i guess yeah, yeah exactly yeah no totally good it, yeah it's really nice to be past some of that and, and i think it's that same thing or the discussion about privilege and if there is a sense of responsibility um we're kind of like past whether there is or not and we're talking yeah. about what how to actually you know and then we're even talking about uh operationalizing or systemizing that so so that we can say are you doing it are you doing it prove it you know so we're really getting the point of trying to create competitive nature and utilize systems and these kind of things so that people can actually tell their story demonstrate it and we can call people out and it can be and it can, can have integrity behind it so we're part of that exactly. while also having to 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 do our own story um yeah. if we wanted to look for uh inspiration or ideas on on what to do as a company you know what do you know about where we might go yeah the um your point to what what you said is prove it and i know um it, it, nothing's going to happen if you don't say we're going to report that to our stakeholders shareholders so um folks who 
I was doing some research and there's some companies that do a really good job of putting themselves out there, not, not being stagnant and then telling us what they're doing. Granted, it's not the most exciting read, but I encourage folks to, before they're engaging with companies or products to do that background research. Yes, the onus is on the, on the consumer, but there's some folks who really put themselves out to, there to do good. And all we have are CSR, corporate sustainability reports, which is fine. And some of them are very engaging, much like the student hotel. They have a great CSR report and they talk about how they hosted seminars for um, International Women's Month, or we've got uh, SITE or site centers, and they're doing a lot for engaging the community and um, rent dynamics. They're going to talk all about how they um, they provide education and towards how to um, use the rent dollars best for their consumers, and they're also they'll be more lenient than a regular landlord. If you miss a month, they're going to work with you. Let's let's talk finances. Let's make this an educational opportunity. And that's what folks need. A lot of folks need because they don't have the privilege to be educated in their traditional. Um, maybe they maybe they just graduate high school and that's totally OK. But from my experience in public high schools in Illinois, and I still I even went to a very good one. We didn't talk about finances. I didn't know how to budget. I had to figure that mm -hmm. out myself. So mm -hmm. so we have these external public companies that are putting in the work and seeing how they're in this position to create an educational opportunity, to engage the community. So that's, and that's what you're going to find in CSR reports. Um, and then and companies are going to have that right on their homepage. It'll be about us, or they'll say sustainability. It'll be a tab on their page typically. And I encourage folks to go engage with that because that's how you're going to find out or else, or else you're really not going to know, engage with their LinkedIn. They're probably going to publish it on their LinkedIn as well. Yeah, no, I, I, appreciate those examples and obviously there are a lot of organizations who are are making great efforts um the other thing the, the conversation that sometimes comes up is well how self-serving are those ideas yeah. and you know and that's another one frankly for me i don't really try and untangle like talk about you know anthropology and how we interact in culture and stuff I don't know. I don't try and untangle the philosophy behind what they're doing too much. I, could you get, sure. is it self-serving? I, maybe it is. Is that the reason they're doing it? What's the outcome? You know, if the outcome is effective, but also they're saying, well, if we educate a bunch of people, it will help our business. Right. So should they not, <laughs> I, okay. <laughs> what I like, I'm not going to then say, oh, well then you're bad. You should do something else. You specifically need to find something that doesn't help your business and truly do it if you want to prove you're selfless or something like that. I'm not worried about all that. Right. Like I read like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Yes. And if someone's like, well, we built these programs because it's important to our customers and actually it helps them. I don't really penalize people for that. Like if the outcome yeah. is impactful, um, I, I don't like to un try and untangle that whole web of uh, is it self-serving or not personally. Yeah, to, um, to expand upon that, it's you're going to get into a vicious cycle of what if and if then. It's what we have to look out for is people just not expanding each year on what they could do. Are they doing more? But then also, yeah. of course, it's self-serving because you have a bottom line to look at. And just like when I'm working with lead projects, we have a triple bottom line. We have we have to meet the environmental requirements. We have to meet their budget requirements. We have to make their we have to meet their um, profit requirements, of course, to stay competitive. And ESG is plays a ro big role in 
staying competitive and the longevity of your company. So sure. is it self-serving? Yes. But is it is there a greater impact on the overall community and people are going to kind of like you more and use you more? Sure. It's really the lesser of two evils. So we're weighing out, yes, maybe the CEO is getting a little richer because you're being engaged with more or they can charge more rent because you're in a lead certified building that yeah but that's what's incentivizing these movements because you can make more money and that's what it kind of boils down to but there's a bigger payout at the end for the larger community or for the environment yeah and a failing company um financially failing company is not sustainable either yeah. so whatever right. other efforts they're doing will eventually end if they don't if they don't make it um you know we do acknowledge that we live in a an economy specifically yeah. a capitalistic one here and yeah. so we're still partaking in that um, unless we wanted to try and change that that's not our our current mission <laughs> our vision is that you know a company is is has the right to uh perform financially but you know we don't know if that means they're a good company or not that you have to measure them otherwise if i you can show me their financial reports and then literally cannot opine on whether they're a good company or not but if yep. you had some system of record that also showed me their environmental and their social performance and that they yep. have actual governance making those things legitimate and have integrity then i can tell you if i believe that it's a company that i would root for or something so Right. That vision actually is very much, I was reading up uh, on the on B corporations and that vision is very much That's kind of the one. B Corp philosophy. Yeah. What do you know about uh, B Corps? Yeah. So they, they have a whole um, B lab that talks about their theory of change and they're all, and so backing up just a little, in case you don't know what a B corporation is, it's a company that's sort of that vets different companies that looks at their um overall impact of their product and their and their societal good that may come out from that product so sort of like well you don't see toms around anymore but toms was the sort of the flagship initiative those shoes yeah that weren't very comfortable uh they <laughs> I couldn't afford it, but that could be uh, divisive. I, I don't know. <laughs> I never had them. Maybe I'm just talking out of turn. Um, but if you buy this fifty dollars pair of shoes or eighty dollars, I don't know how much it was. Um, you could you have one, and then that would then fund someone else having one. Um, but then B Corp takes it a little step further. Like, how how is this product made, and what impact does your product and the making of your product have on its surrounding environment. Are they made? Is it is it a nice and shiny company at first? And you can say made in the USA or or designed in the USA, but it's actually made overseas. Mm -hmm. So are you creating jobs? Is it a sort of a local quote unquote product? Um, and so that's gonna and then B B Lab and B Corps are making their um, they're becoming more stringent. They're making their guidelines more stringent, much like Lean and Well and FitWell, where they're making the certification more rigorous because the technology is stepping up to the plate and the awareness is stepping up to the plate to encourage a, an increased rigor in, oh, you want this certification on your product or building house well, this is what you're going to have to do. And we know the resources resources are out there. However, with lead and well, and this is why I like fit well a lot, lead and well can be very expensive. So there is a pay to play element. And um, I don't have a product that I would want B Corp. I don't have a product at all, but I have, I don't know the in-depth nature of the B Corp certification process but I'm sure there's a pay to play element as well. So Fitwell's a little cheaper, well, well in lead, they have that really meaty, rigorous element that says our building is really high performing. And so B Corp can, they can also top that as well. We're, we're a very rigorous certification and a website that I like. So if you wanted to shop around for B Corp products, 
or even businesses can be a B Corp. Um, on the bcorporation.net website, you can go to the tab, find a B Corp, and then you can type in the product or the service that you want, and not sponsored, I wish, uh, find a B Corp, <laughs> and uh, you can see, and they'll find something for you. There's also one, for if you want to right. peruse like Mother's Day and Father's Day, you can go to uncommongoods.com. That's really mm-hmm. nice because that's all B, B Corporation products. So there's resources, you have to dig for it. So again, onus on the consumer, but there's stuff out there and they're putting themselves out there, but they don't really have the resources to market themselves like these maybe cheaper products, but they don't do as much good for the community or the environment as these other products do. Yeah, I... um. Like you said, they don't sponsor us yet anyway, but um, <laughs> I had an Fingers attorney crossed. kind of explain a, a particular portion of B Corp to me. And if I have this, oh, this right, yeah, I think to be a, I think certified, you can get us to be a certified B Corp, I think is the terminology, but mm-hmm. I had someone explain it to me once. And what it does is, so as a company, I think, let, let's say a public company, if you're a public company, you have a responsibility to do what's best for the bottom line for your shareholders. You have some legal responsibility to have to do that in most, in like almost any like charter or something. If you're a B Corp, you're changing your charter so that you're actually making it that as the leaders of the company, there are scenarios where you can make a decision that might not be best financially but it's better for another purpose. It has a good environmental or social impact. Most of the times the charters for most companies won't let you do that. You always, at the end of the day, if there's if there's a truly clear financially better path, you're supposed to take that. But if you've committed to B Corp, you have to put in this charter that says, even if it's not the best thing financially for my shareholders, I can think it's the best thing for the business in a broader sense, and I can therefore do it without breaking my charter something to that effect and i'm sure someone's gonna say you got all the legal things wrong or whatever about it but <laughs> it's an interesting concept that you can be in a boardroom and say no no we don't have to. someone's gonna go no that's the that's the best financial thing you know well we're a b corp we don't have to do that we can do this other thing yeah um that i think will help our company long term even though on paper it doesn't look like it's going to help us next quarter financially so uh, i thought that was pretty pretty interesting that's great i learned something that's great yeah um well, I find philosophical anthropology or anthropology uh, very interesting. It's great that the ESG, the world of ESG drives us to think about our our direct relationships, like where we started talking about um, uh, employees and each other and colleagues. And then you said, OK, well, there's the local community, uh, maybe even a, a national community, a global community. Have you thought about multi-planet? anthropology yet or does the scope stop at earth hannah uh well we don't have another earth so let's focus on this one but once (laughs) but once humans start uh uh, collaborating and creating a society and culture on maybe mars then we can uh we can talk about uh, interplanetary uh, anthropology we'll see how that goes i don't know if i'll be alive for it we'll see yeah well um yeah it will be interesting if the uh the way that we interact as humans changes much i think to your opening point it probably won't we'll just be on mars still needing uh, (laughs) shelter and love and all these things and still interacting in very similar ways is what uh what i learned today um well hannah i really appreciate uh your time and expertise and that conversation i could go on for a long time about it. Same. It's very it was cool very, stuff. Sorry to interrupt. It was a very no. brief overview. There's so many layers of anthropology and there's so many facets we can look at. Um, so this was a very, very, very brief overview of what could be done and what we can challenge our different companies to do. Good. Well, let's continue the conversation. Hopefully this is a, a launching pad for others. Um, of course, I can't let you out of here until we play our fan favorite uh, game that we have to bring some uh, levity to these very important conversations that we're, that we're having. But this is a very simple thing. You have to just guess. I'm going to tell you, you probably know this as, a, as an avid listener, but it's called Beans or Beer. 
Love I'm going to say the name of of some craft thing that brews either beer or beans that makes either beer or beans. So all you got to do is say beans or beer. This is a place in Pilsen. I know you're a Chicagoland person. This is mm -hmm. a place in Pilsen, the neighborhood of Pilsen in the city, and it's called Low Res. This one's a tricky one, man. I think it's beer. You got it. It's beer. Yes. Beer is called Low Res Brewing and Tap Room. And why I'm willing to plug them, they are dog friendly. Yes. Not Finally. only outside, but indoors. You can bring dogs indoors. I went there one time on like New Year's Day and it was still cold and it was a really nice um, place. So in Pilsen, low res brewing and tap room, dog friendly. Sign me up. I'm going. Yeah, check it out. Well, thank you again, Hannah, and thank you for everyone joining us on the ESG Experience Podcast. There is a new episode every month. If you enjoyed your time with us, make sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast directory. Our guest for the next episode will be Eddie Sofer from the Interactive Brokers, or from Interactive Brokers, no the, just Interactive Brokers. We will talk about his journey to ESG, compliance, greenwashing, and also the future of ESG. Thanks to our loyal subscribers for continuing to listen and support our podcast. If you want to continue the conversation between episodes, follow us on your favorite social media channel at hashtag ESG experience. Again, thank you, Hannah. Really appreciate your time, expertise, you. and the conversation. It was fun. Thank you so much, Ryan. Good. Bye, everybody. Bye.